Welcome to the podcast, Larry and Jose. You guys are here from Delphi Digital. Um, can you tell me about your background and what got you into crypto initially? Yeah, so I came from a natural science background. I did a PhD in biochemistry. I didn't graduate, uh, but at some point I started investing in crypto because I feel it had a much better risk reward profile than stock market, etc. And over time, I started programming on it myself and yeah, just got hired and ended up where I am now. And Jose? Yeah, um, I'm getting some echo now from this recording. Nice. Yeah, so I, um, I started off uh, in my, my teens, was, was a professional kind of poker player, ended up playing some of the, some of the highest stakes online. Uh, that's kind of how I got into like the, the game theory and, and, and thing, side of things. Uh, then went to university, studied um, philosophy and economics and started a, started a couple of businesses while at university. Most of them were, were like your typical kind of startup fails. Um, and then one of them ended up uh, was an e-commerce business that ended up kind of selling to a, to a big um, wholesaler in, in London. And then pretty much at the same time kind of came across crypto, uh, fell down the rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, I started working in the space in, in early 2017 and have, have kind of been, been, been there ever since. The, most of the focus was on token economics for, for the first few years, just because that's where my interests lay with like the econ and, and kind of game theory background. Um, did a lot of cool work there and a lot, a lot of cool research there with, with, with Delphi. Um, and then started, so we, with Delphi Labs, we, we started off kind of, that's what we did. We did token econ consulting where we worked with People like Axie Infinity and Synthetics and Aave and Compound, Balancer, a bunch of top projects in the space. And then at some point, we, we kind of decided to, to stop doing that and really focus on, on building out our own, our own projects and, and, and contribute to projects more from the ground up. And that's kind of, that was kind of a year ago, started off doing that. Um, and kind of Mars and Astroport are sort of the two projects that I guess we, we have contributed the most to. But then there are also others that we, that we advise and, and, and help. Um, and yeah, Labs has... Now we're, we're around, so at Delphi overall, we're about uh, 120 uh, between ventures, research, and, and labs. And then labs itself is, is around 50, 50 people. Uh, so mostly developers, but also uh, sort of economists, product people, uh, a risk team, you know, lawyers now as well. So yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Uh, can you quickly elaborate about the different branches in Delphi again and go into more detail about what each is responsible for? Research is, is, is how we, we started off. So just kind of uh, institutional grade research on various projects and, and protocols in the space. So uh, it's a kind of a, a subscription business and that's probably how most people have, have heard of us. Um, so that's, that's kind of that. And it's sort of the core of Delphi, right? We're a very research oriented organization. Uh, we have kind of 40 or so full-time researchers focused on different parts of the space from different layer one ecosystems to DeFi to Web3 to, to all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and then Ventures is, is uh, our, our investing arm where uh, we, we don't have any outside capital. So it's all our, our own money, kind of the, the money of the, the seven founders. Um, and then we have Labs, which is started off as our, as our consulting arm, where, which kind of paid the bills in the bear market. Um, and then move to, to being our, our building and kind of software development arm where we're basically contributing to, to different projects in the space. And Ventures is the one that had in, seeded Axie Infinity, right? And that was kind of your zero to one moment. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, Axie Infinity, actually, we, we worked with via uh, labs, although labs didn't exist at the time, but we did, we consulted with them. And then we also invested in them via Ventures. And that was definitely our... Yeah, our, our, our kind of zero to one moment. Um, we, we we were very um, excited about that, and and it was it was, it was I think it's our definitely our our sort of biggest winner on the on the venture side. Is there a story there? How did they identify Axie Infinity and say, ah, this is this is the next you know bet that I'm going to make? You know, before Axie, there wasn't even this concept of pay to earn. Sorry, play to earn. Yeah, uh, and then now it's just the thing that everybody is pitching investors. Um, so actually, uh, it's funny, the Delphi's first uh, consulting gig back in, I think it was in 2018, was uh, to do a deep dive into like crypto gaming projects. So uh, at the time, there, there wasn't that much happening, but uh, 
the 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 team did the research and Axie came up as like the number one name uh, that, that 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 was doing most exciting stuff. Even in 2018, they already had like a, a really cool community and, and and stuff going on. So kind of knew about them from from, from that. Um, and then got approached to 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 design the token because we'd already been working on on, on token econ for for a lot of kind of projects in the space and really got to know the project and the, and the team through that and kind of understood the the potential of of um, I guess like we, I'm I'm not as involved on the gaming side anymore. So like my uh, partners Jan and 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 Piers and 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 Ryan Fu could could speak much more eloquently about this. But uh, we understood the potential of uh, we'd call it probably play and earn or, or play fi rather than rather than play to earn. So I think there are some some flaws of play to earn and like critics often kind of stand up these straw mans about about play to earn um, that, that that aren't really what what we're excited about and, and what what we invested in. But we, we just got really excited about, we're all gamers as well. So we just got really excited about the potential of, of kind of user-owned economies and like building in these incentives into the game layer. And later on, even stuff like on-chain games and, and stuff like that. Like we we're, we think gaming is is uh, is probably the, the crypto use case that, that's going to end up bringing in like mass market and that, that, that makes most sense. How do you imagine this industry evolving where gaming might be the killer application of blockchain tech. How does the blockchain come in and how does that provide some sort of distinct advantage for gaming? I guess it would be in the marketplace. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's, it's a really good question because there, there's different levels of, of how that can be done. And again, I'm not the, I'm definitely not the most uh, well-versed person at, at, at Delphi on this. I, I spent the last like 18 months just focused on on building stuff and building DeFi. So like that's that's the, the bit that I can speak to more, more eloquently. Um, but I think, yeah, high level, there's, there's, there's a, a bunch of different ways. I think one of them that, that's often uh, underrated is, is just like the ease of uh, like creating a new business model for indie game devs, uh, where like game developers actually have like a pretty horrible life at traditional gaming companies. Like we have partners who, who, who are pretty in the industry and, and it's like very hard deadlines, uh, not much, not, not great pay. And, and indie game devs have, have a really hard time. Uh, I think blockchain creates like a really good sort of business model for that. Uh, and it also has like, we've seen a bunch of kind of the top devs from, from traditional world, including like founders of EVE Online, founders of League of Legends, all kind of make moves into, in, into crypto gaming. Um, I think the other part is sort of uh, being able to own the assets in the game yourself. Although um, obviously there's some like, you might own the assets, but the game has to sort of honor the experience that's attached to those assets, right? So there's always a, a point of centralization. But I think there's, uh, and that's where kind of on-chain gaming gets interesting, and also like open source games where where you can kind of have these these forks where you kind of keep the assets. But that that's I think something for 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 later on. And then I do think like players being able to own uh, sort of part of the of, of the value of the game that they're that they're playing and and building towards, and being able to earn that value by playing. And by by becoming more skilled, I think is is a huge part of this. Um, for, from from my perspective, I also think blockchain is really useful at creating new business models for like esports. Um, we we recently had uh, Brooks um, on our, on our podcast. He's building a game called Nor on a, on a disruptor series, and, and he talks about this kind of the like for me the the most interesting games are kind of the most skillful, and and, and those are also the most meaningful. And I think uh, crypto can create like a really interesting sort of uh, business model for the for those games in terms of um, yeah uh, but uh, again like I'm I'm uh, not the most eloquent person on this so I'll I'll just I'll just leave it there I think for now sure and and we got a little distracted um, so let's let's go back to what you guys are are, are working on right which is uh, Mars protocol uh, tell us more about that Mars protocol I guess the 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 base of Mars protocol is kind of a, a money market similar to, to, to one you, you'd understand like Aave or Compound where users can come in, deposit their assets and use them as collateral to take out loans, right? Over collateralized loans. But the big kind of uh, inside of, of, of Mars protocol, I guess, is that those protocols are, are naturally kind of capital inefficient because you can only uh, borrow less than what you put in, right? Because, because you can take the money that you borrow anywhere uh, they can't. They can never give you more than than what you put in as collateral because there's no incentive for you to ever pay it back, right? Whereas what we see with like centralized exchanges that offer like 10x and 100x leverage, the reason they can do that is because they're they're effectively like custodying the assets, right? And they can liquidate you if if the position moves against you. And so Mars creates this 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 primitive called uh, contract lending or contract to contract lending, which is the idea that you have a pool of assets and 
it's not just users who, who have deposits on the platform that can, that can borrow from it. You can also have a smart contract that effectively applies from, for a credit line from Mars Protocol, which if approved, uh, allows it to pull, uh, like to, to effectively borrow from, from that pool. And so one initial use case for this is like leveraged yield farming. And you can think of what Alpha was doing, Alpha Hamara was doing on Ethereum as kind of an example of this, where they had their IB ETH pools, right? Which, which was like the kind of money market side. And then you had leveraged yield farmers ETH. on the other side. Yeah, exactly. Interest bearing ETH on one side, which is kind of their money market. And then you had um, you had the, the leveraged yield farmers who would come in and borrow that ETH in order to farm, right? And that was effectively the leveraged yield farming contract is borrowing from the money market, right? And that creates much higher efficiency because uh, you, you can technically offer as much leverage as, as, uh, as sort of your ability to liquidate. Like you could do margin trading with this architecture. You can do leveraged yield farming. Someone could come in and build something like a decentralized FTX or, or Binance on top, which combines different margin positions in, into one account. Um, you can do leverage staking. Uh, and it basically means that any protocol which needs leverage can like use Mars rather than having to kind of build their own money market, right? Um, and so I think that's the the kind of core innovation uh, behind behind Mars from 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 my perspective is just to allow far deeper capital efficiency by making it so that if you think about it in traditional money markets, the only people that can uh, borrow are lenders, right? You have to be a depositor to be able to borrow. So it's kind of like if to Hey, in, in, in Airbnb, you had to be a host as well, right? To use Airbnb, you had to be a host as well. Whereas what Mars opens up is the ability for, for non-depositors to also be able to borrow and to kind of borrow for a bunch of different use cases. Um, yeah, I'll let Larry jump in because I know he has, he's, he's very good at explaining this stuff too, and maybe has a different way of doing it. Yeah, I just want to add that um, our, we have created a, like a proof of concept uh, leverage protocol called Fields of Mars that utilizes uncollateralized lending from Mars protocol that operates on a number of yield farms on Terra before it crashed. Uh, and it worked pretty well. And even during the Terra crash, which was quite unfortunate, it worked very well liquidating all the users and kept the whole protocol solvent. So everything worked as intended in a very antagonist, like totally apocalyptic situation, I should say. So definitely sorry for those who are liquidated, but the protocol, like at least the fields of Mars part worked like pretty remarkably well. And what was the recovery plan afterwards? You guys built on Terra, things worked, but it was sort of a existential crisis that you guys were facing with the collapse of the Terra uh, stable coin, as well as um, the the entire chain itself because there was there was no value um, collateralizing the Terra blockchain as Luna went down to zero. How did you guys figure out a recovery plan and and what did that look like and how did that lead you to osmosis? Yeah, um, in terms of recovery plan, there was no uh, bad debt on the protocol actually. Like liquidations functioned as 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 normal. Um, there was a lot of like war rooming going on that maybe uh, Larry can can go into. But um, uh, yeah, there was, there was kind of a vote to unlock lock drop deposits, which were people that had, had locked UST for, for up to 12 months so that they could, so they could take that out and, and, and sell it or migrate it to the new network. But there was no, no kind of bad debt or recovery plan in that way. Uh, what we did have was, yeah, like, like you said, kind of figuring out what to do as, as next steps, right? And, and where, we wanted, where we wanted to go. And I think our, our vision for, for kind of DeFi and how we were building uh, or, or how we were contributing to, to Mars and Astroport was uh, of sort of an integrated DeFi experience, right? And for, for me, I don't think users uh, eventually will want to go to one place to trade, somewhere else to, to lend and borrow. You know, they don't want to go to Uniswap to trade, go to Aave to lend and borrow, go Perpetual Protocol to trade perps, you know, go to, to Balancer to do LVPs. Like they want to have it all in, in, in one place and have like this integrated DeFi experience. Um, and I think there's a few people building towards that. And that was sort of, uh, our vision of, of um, how, how we thought DeFi should progress and what we were kind of pushing for on, on Terra, where, you know, you, you needed these key primitives, you need, you need the, the lending protocol and with, the, with this contract to contract lending, you needed the AMM. And then when you have those two primitives, you can kind of create this like credit account, which, which was an idea we were working on. Uh, if, if you're familiar with Gearbox or if your listeners are familiar with Gearbox on Ethereum, that, that's kind of a, a similar, similar primitive. Which well, can just you elaborate you, on that? Yeah. So the user experience is basically 
um, think about it like you come in, you deposit, let's say $100 uh, of a stable coin and you're given $500 of a stable coin that, that you can use to trade. But rather than being able to, to take that anywhere and, and do anything with it, you can only interact with whitelisted applications, right? So for example, you might be able to use it to buy certain tokens on an AMM or to LP into certain pools on an AMM or to, to, to do certain staking, to stake, buy certain staking derivatives or whatever it might be. And so what, what it does is this, this credit account um, in for, like calculates a, a health factor formula, which basically takes into account all your assets and, and it, right, it's like collateral over debt. And for all your collateral assets, it applies a multiplier to them based on the, on the riskiness of them. And then it can calculate like a health factor for your whole account. And you can have one liquidation point on the account, which means that you, you, you can sort of have leverage at the credit account level. And then you can use that to interact with a bunch of whitelisted DeFi applications. So it's effectively creating like this kind of centralized exchange account primitive, right? Or like a sub account on FTX. And you can create multiple of them. We were going to make them an NFT and have them like equipable on your on your PFP and stuff like that. So you can have like social training. There's a bunch of cool ideas that that uh, that you can do with it. But that's the basic idea. It's once you have a money market with this primitive of contract lending and you have like an AMM, you can kind of combine them to create this this new primitive of a, of a credit account. Um, and then obviously you, you can add more sort of uh, Lego pieces to this credit account because it'll just be like a governance process to whitelist different assets. So you could add perps to this credit account, or you, you could add certain you know launchpad projects to, the, to this credit account and it becomes more and more useful um and so that was sort of the the, the vision and um we we realized there was a few projects building towards it but um i think osmosis was the team that we spoke to uh, that we most clicked with in terms of like super smart team um very technical and also had the same vision of this of this app chain i personally actually was was surprised by that because i thought Osmosis was was kind of the AMM chain, right? Like the Cosmos app chain, like AMM chain. But when I spoke to Sonny, I realized that uh, he saw uh, AMM not not as like just purely exchange, but like the broad vision of an exchange like Binance, right? Where you can do spot, you can do margin, you can do perps, you have launchpad. And so realized we were aligned on that vision. And and rather than trying to um, do it on sort of on sort of our own app chain, we could we could try and kind of uh, do it together on on Osmosis. And then I think. For us, the, we, we always had this idea, and I'll let Larry go into this because it's his baby, but we, we always had this idea of the Mars app chain um, sort of being the, the optimal design for, for a money market because um, a, a money market really needs to be wherever there's demand for leverage, right? Any chain that has yield or that has leverage trading opportunities or that has demand for leverage, a money market needs to be there. And so there needs to be outposts on several chains, similar to what Aave is, is doing. But um, like ideally, there, there should be some hub that kind of moves liquidity around these chains to sort of optimize utilization and to make sure that capital is wherever it, wherever it needs to be, both for to satisfy borrowing demand and also for like safety reasons. For instance, if there's like a tariff situation, right? Where you need, where utilization hits 100% and, and you can't liquidate. So that's kind of the design for, for Mars Chain, but I'll, I'll let, uh, yeah. So I answered like Osmosis and Mars Chain. So I'll let Larry jump in on, on, on this as well. Yeah, so yeah, first of all, the idea of Mars Chain was coined by Sunny, not me, so credits to him. So the idea of a Mars chain, well, to explain that, we we first think about those OG Ethereum lending protocols like Aave and Compound, right? So what they do is there are multiple EVM chains and they can, and basically what they do is they deploy a copy of their protocol on each of those EVM chains. So you might have Aave on Ethereum L1, you might have the same Aave on Polygon, you have the same one on Avalanche, and these copies of the same protocol, they don't necessarily share their liquidity. So you might have a bunch of USDC on Ethereum that say nobody wants to borrow, but you might have some USDC on Polygon that lots of people wants to borrow and are in very short supply, right? So in that case, this will be quite inefficient. You need some smart market makers to, to do their things and move liquidity between these chains. So, so they are not automatic and the liquidity is fragmented, very inefficient. So there has been multiple efforts to solve this. So Aave in their V3 created a, I forgot their name, but it's some sort of hub that can transfer liquidity between chains. Compound tried to build their own chain, but they ultimately gave up. Uh, Boomi is, is a good attempt. Uh, so the architecture is they're going to have an app chain that has a money market sitting on top of it. 
and all the liquidity gets transferred to Umi chain and all the borrowing and lendings ha happen on Umi chain. So that was the model that I initially wanted to go for, but after some chats with Sunny and other Osmosis developers, what they pointed out was that Umi's design make it kind of difficult for protocols to integrate. And the reason is this, let's say you have a protocol on Osmosis and wants to borrow some money from Mars protocol. Let's consider if, if Mars lending market sits on a different chain. So what happens is the Osmosis protocol needs to first host a transaction to Osmosis IBC module. Uh, basically, they are borrowing requests, right? If, if, if you post that message to the IBC module and a relayer will pick that up and relay that to the UMI chain. So UMI will see that message executed and send the asset back to Osmosis and a relayer will pick up that message, relay it back to Osmosis. So the whole process, you need three block confirmations at least. One block of the initial request on Osmosis the second would be the relayer relaying the message to UMI and execute. The third one would be from UMI back to Osmosis and confirm that receipt on Osmosis. So you need three blocks just for that one borrowing. The thing is, maybe for borrowing is fine, but for, for other more complex things like, like let's say swap, you, you want to send an asset and trade for another asset back. The thing is, if, if, the process takes multiple blocks. You cannot precisely predict what's the outcome of that swap. You don't know exactly what, how much asset you will get back. Uh, but we can think of many use cases where the application might need to know how much asset it will get back in order to perform the next step uh, actions. So, so overall, what I want to say is IBC is cool. Uh, IBC makes a lot of interchain interactions possible, but it's still much more challenging than if your protocol and the protocol it wants to interact with all sits on the same chain. So, so like, like, like that's a fact. It's, it's just not that easy to work with. So the model we opted for is that we're going to put Mars lending market on many different chains as long as the chain satisfies some criteria, like it needs to have an Oracle, it needs to have demand for borrowing it, because it has DeFi activities, it needs to have sufficient liquidity for liquidation, et cetera. Um, and Osmosis is definitely the top candidate in the Cosmos ecosystem for that. And we're going to have these multiple markets on various chains, but then we come to the same issue that happens with Aave and Pound Pound, which they have fragmented liquidity. So the solution is we're going to have an app chain that sitting, sits in the middle that coordinates all these assets. If this uh, coordinates all those markets, right? So if, if this market say has an excess of USDC that has a lot of supply, not enough demand, the other market has a shortage of USDC, then the Mars app chain should be able to detect this and move the assets accordingly to balance things out. So that's the general idea. So if I'm understanding this correctly, your new model is going to be one such that you, uh, well, you're, you're basically relaunching on Osmosis first just to kick it off, but then you're gonna move on to building your own app chain and that's gonna be the sort of um, canonical source of all the activities in your money market, but you're also going to have multi-chain deployment across many other L1s, but have the hub act as the sort of beacon chain almost in the ETH2 concept. Am I understanding that, that right? Yeah, I think that's an accurate description of the design. So one thing in our design is that this, what we call Mars hub, you call beacon chain, it doesn't need to really exist, right? So because the osmosis market is fully functioning on its own. If we put a market on Juno, it should be fully functioning on, on its own. Um, the only thing is that in absence of this beacon chain, the liquidity will not be able to, these markets will not be able to coordinate each other to move assets around. Uh, the, the purpose of adding the smart hub chain in the middle is to coordinate this market. But, but even if say all IBC relayers are offline, no, 
no IBC messages goes across, each of these, what, what we call satellite markets should be able to function completely fine on their own. Let's say that this Mars hub existed before the Terra blow up. Um, would you have been able to have a more seamless recovery plan? You know, was it, would it have been more, the, the devastation been more uh, isolated to just the Terra blockchain rather than something that's more systemic to, to your entire protocol? I'm, I'm interpreting your question as if the Mars hub is connecting all these markets, there was a risk of one market spreads to all other markets. Is that what oh, you're asking? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm asking how would um, the Terra explosion, how would that have been different to Mars had you had the hub before the blow up and not just had your entire money market dependent on one chain? So actually I do believe we were already discussing Mars chain as an idea even before the blow up, right? I think. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not like, oh, Terra is dead, Mars protocol is, is shut down, we need to find a different idea. It's not, it's not like we are desperately trying to- Okay, that was always part of the plan, even, even when you were on Terra. Well, at least we, we have been discussing it. Although I think at the time we were more inclined to use the UMI model instead of this Mars hub one, but we have always been discussing this as a, as a possible yeah. free tool or let's say experimental exploration. Right? Yeah, I think we always saw uh, Terra as, as a first like outpost, um, but uh, like uh, I think ultimately a, a credit protocol needs to be like wherever there's demand for, for, for leverage and clearly there's demand for leverage in other places than, than Terra. So we were discussing the, the kind of optimal architecture for that. And I think, yeah, we had, basically we had sort of doubts between whether we should have all assets sit on the hub chain or kind of uh, as this new design, none of the assets sit on the hub, hub chain. And I think there, there's like practical reasons mainly to do with liquidations and stuff for why it makes more sense to, well, for why we, we decided this, this design makes more sense where basically nothing sits on the, on the hub chain. Um, and then in terms of risk, yeah, the, the risk part becomes, becomes really important because um, risk is shared amongst, amongst all the different outposts. Um, and that, that's also a benefit, right? Because it means that you, you can effectively use an asset on, on any outpost as collateral to, to kind of borrow one, one from another. And also that the borrowing, like smart contract borrowing can happen uh, directly on, on chains rather than, as Larry mentioned, have to go through these, these multiple hops. So um, yeah, the, the risk stuff becomes, becomes really important. And that's why we've, we've kind of put a lot of time into developing this open source risk framework, consulted with a lot of different people in, in, in the industry. And we also have um, like some, some risk uh, like experts at, at Delphi that kind of work on this and are helping us think through some stuff to, to propose. Um, but yeah, that, that becomes super important. Yeah, I would be curious as to like what sort of backstops you guys uh, are thinking through uh, because you know if you have multiple different outposts and as Larry alluded to, um, if any one of them uh, goes through some sort of like mass extinction event, um, similar to what happened with the UST, right? It wasn't just contained in the Terra chain because the liquidity was just in so many different pools and so many different um, sexes such that everyone became exit liquidity for UST holders. So you're you're probably going to run into some sort of issue, catastrophic issue like that in the future. So what, what would be the sort of backstops that you guys are thinking through to yeah. just like minimize um, damage? In the case of, of like the, the Terra meltdown and, and money markets generally, uh, the, the main risk, is, well, the, the risk is basically not being able to liquidate a position, right? Such that it becomes underwater. Uh, so the collateral is, is worth less than the, than the debt. Um, and that can happen because the, the death the debt like balloons in, in, in value too fast for, for liquidators to update, uh, or there's some Oracle bug where, where it doesn't update or some manipulation or because the collateral value goes to, goes to zero too quickly. Right. And so um, in, in, in the case of even the, the, the Terra meltdown, I actually think it, it would have mostly been, been fine. Um, like liquidations happened in an, in an orderly fashion on Mars. Uh, the positions that needed to be liquidated were, were, were liquidated. And so uh, other markets wouldn't, wouldn't actually have been, uh, affected by this by this that much now there were some problems uh for sure like the the oracle accounted for ust as as one dollar 
And so when UST was trading uh, below the peg for a sustained period of time, it created sort of sort of problems and, and there were other other problems like that. And I think that's where um, basically the 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 kind of toggles that that the uh, that the Martian Council has to has has are whether the asset can be used as collateral, right? What the LTV is, and then the the, the liquidation parameter. Um, and I think like Ave did some really pioneering work on this in terms of coming up with some with some baselines for for what this for what this needs to be. Uh, we've sort of done our own simulations on this and kind of made some 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 adjustments to that. And then obviously for contract lending, a whole new other framework needs to be created. But uh, I think if those parameters are are, are set right, uh, there's no reason why um, even a sort of a catastrophic chain blow up like like Luna would would actually sort of uh, cause an insolvency event in the in the money market. Um, and I think the way that that's uh, ensured is to sort of make sure that the the Martian Council uh, or the people making these decisions who also have the upside have skin in the game. Um, and so, like for 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 Mars, it was designed such that there's obviously an, an insurance fund which was denominated in, in UST, which was being grown through fees, so so wasn't wasn't that big yet. Um, but then there was also the Martian Council itself, which uh, stakes and 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 has like a locked stake. And if there's a shortfall event, they're actually it's their X Mars, it's their Mars that's like auctioned off first, similar to the Maker system to make to make users whole. And so they have both the upside of the system, but also the the downside and the skin in the game in case their decisions lead to lead to bad sort of consequences. Um, yeah, so I think there's like an inst those are the parameters basically that I, I, I don't think a chain blow up needs to be. Uh, existential as long as the parameters are set right and then it's about nailing the incentives for the governors to set those parameters right and, and i think that's yeah what we're what uh yeah the mars team tried to do and who yeah. is the martian council yeah uh the martian council is anyone who who decides to stake their mars for x mars uh and effectively lock it up for for 14 days and then that's the only way you can vote on governance decisions and and you X Mars also accrues fees similar to, to, to X Sushi. Got it. So anyone can be a member of the of the Martian Council. I see. Okay. I'm sorry, what were you saying, Larry, before I interrupted you? Yeah, so uh, I'm actually thinking about the specific case of Terra blowing up. So I think actually having this Mars chain model actually make it safer, actually, perhaps because one of the uh, problems we had during the Terra blow up was that the Terra money market did not have enough Luna in the market to carry out liquidations because at the time Luna was going down faster than UST did. So a lot of positions who were borrowing UST against Luna collateral needs to be liquidated. And to carry out this liquidation, you need Luna tokens to be available in the market. But at the time, a lot of Luna tokens were borrowed away. So with, uh, an issue was we, we didn't have enough Luna in the market. Um, but we, we ultimately uh, was able to source some Luna to cover this. But we imagine if we had this Mars chain design, if we have a separate market on osmosis, for example, that has an excess of Luna, then Mars Hub could have potentially noticed the shortage on, of Luna on the Terra market and moved the excess Luna from osmosis to Luna to basically allow the liquidation process to go through and therefore secure the whole protocol to be solvent, right? So it actually could perhaps reduce the overall risk of the protocol. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, how could you have done that without mass coordination with osmosis governance? Because um, in order to have taken the liquidity out of osmosis, you had to go through just like a, again, like an emergency unbonding. Uh, I mean, Luna deposited in Mars market on osmosis, not, not on osmosis DEX. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, never mind. That's a different thing. Is there anything that you guys can talk to about Astroport? We're still kind of uh, deciding uh, next steps for, for Astroport in, in the short term. Uh, I think the community has decided to, to launch Astroport on, on Terra V2. And so Astroport will, will be there. Um, and then exploring kind of different cross-chain designs, different potential places that, that, that Astroport can, can go. But um, yeah, no, no su like super relevant uh, news for now. I think the way that uh, sort of Mars used to interact with Astroport on, on Terra Classic 
is similar to how Mars will interact with osmosis on, on osmosis, right? Where it's facilitating leverage on both LPing and, 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 and eventually trading as well. Yeah, so am I understanding it correctly that it made sense for you guys to have Astroport continue on Luna V2 um, as a dApp, I suppose, without, yeah. without a stable coin, and then for you to move Mars to Osmosis because it has more liquidity um, and, and you could create yeah. a money market here. What about, are, are you able to talk about Avatar? I mean, the, the idea, so like we uh, are believers in like um, NFTs is facilitating kind of decentralized identity effectively and, and specifically like the idea of non-transferable NFTs, which were recently kind of popularized in the Vitalik paper is, is kind of soul bond NFTs. But we'd been working on this for, for a while um, with the idea that it, it can kind of create this emergent decentralized identity, right? Uh, out of these sort of NFTs that you, you earn for, let's say, participating in a lock drop or being a big LP somewhere or, um, you know, being a valid, valuable community member somewhere or having a Delphi research membership or passing KYC on some, on some exchange, right? All of these can provide like these emergent um, kind of data points about, about a user and about a wallet, um, which, can, which can help uh, just provide like data around who a wallet is, right, effectively. Um, and then the idea with Avatar was that uh, you could combine these visually and have sort of like a fingerprint of a user that you could see visually. And so it was the, the initial use case was kind of like a composable PFP. So you could have sort of a, a, an avatar, let, let's say like a, a galactic punk or something. And then you could equip like, let's say Mars issues a hat to, to lock drop participants. You could equip like the Mars hat and then an Astroport badge or, or, or something like that, or, or a hoodie or a Delphi hoodie, whatever it might be, um, and have these like composable kind of PFPs. Um, but really it's like, I think the, the best way to think about it is, is just kind of like a, a fingerprint or a way to see a, a bunch of data about a wallet like visually. Um, and so the, yeah, there was, I think the, the idea initially was to, was to launch on Terra just given that uh, Mars and Astroport were there. And, and so it made sense in terms of like we could issuing NFTs there. And, and, and there was also a big network of projects that were, that were interested in, in using this. But I think given what happened to Terra um, and like just the, 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 lead, the lead that, um, Ethereum has in terms of NFTs probably makes sense for Avatar to, to move somewhere like EVM. Um, and then we're working really closely with the Delphi research side because we're, we're, we're looking to do some, some cool stuff in terms of non-transferable NFTs there. So yeah, not, not much info on what we're doing, but I think EVM is, is, is sort of um, what we're considering most, most strongly right now. And would that be an EVM chain in Cosmos or just straight Ethereum or an Ethereum L2? Yeah, good question. I, th I think it would be probably be an Ethereum L2 at, at this point, or um, yeah, I think I think an Ethereum L2 is, is, is probably what, what makes the most sense. Are you able to but elaborate? We'd, we'd probably consider deploying on Evmos as well. Uh, if if uh, yeah, once once that was live. Is anyone from Mars Protocol coming to OsmoCon? Uh, I believe so. It, it actually overlaps with a, a, a sort of Delphi like retreat that we've been reorganized for a while. So uh, most of most of us are going to be in in uh, like there at that time. But I do think we have one or two team members going. So we'd love to to hang out and and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll we can set that up. Great. And when you when you guys do a retreat, is that when all 120 people show up? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's huge. yeah. That's it. Yeah. I mean. Uh, we, yeah, we last retreat there was like uh, like fifty of us or something. So it's just it, it's grown a lot since. This will be this will be a big one. It, it's it's been like a logistical uh, ordeal to to organize. But yeah, it's gonna be 120 people showing up. So we have a bunch of different like rented out hotels and villas and all sorts, and so we can be in the same place. Yeah. And then everyone gets to meet and like hang out and cross. It, it, it's always really productive because we're fully remote. Like we've always been fully remote. So a bunch of people have, that have been working together, especially. In, before the last retreat with where was COVID and stuff, a bunch of people that have been working together for like years had never met, you know? Um, and, you know, even people, yeah, the work really closely together, speak every day had never met. So it was really cool. And then also you get to meet people on, on different parts of the business and create that relationship, which is like the, the kind of hive mind is, is really the big value of Delphi. I think that everyone's just sort of uh, really deep in the weeds in their own areas, right? Everyone, everyone's super deep into crypto. And so, um, there's a lot of like cross pollination of ideas and like, you know, the, the research really powers a lot of what we do at labs. And then there's, for instance, when we were thinking about Astroport token economics or something, we have like researchers that have been covering convex and curve for like years. And so 
understand it really well um, and, and can help. When we're thinking about Mars, we have people that are that are experts in money markets. So there's there's all these synergies and like the retreat really helps bring that out. And it's just just a lot of fun as well. Yeah, that sounds like a great culture where just a bunch of smart people come and sit in the same room and then you just create some sort of ideas on a whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. That's where yeah, that's, that's where products, good products happen. That's it. Yeah, that's how we see Delphi really. They're just like, we want to be the best place for for kind of smart people to come together and, and build cool, cool stuff in crypto. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone's, yeah, like all the different divisions are, are pretty much aligned in, in, in trying to do that. That's absolutely wonderful. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys at uh, OsmoCon. Hopefully we will meet in person there and see everyone else who's listening at our party for the Osmosis one year anniversary party. Awesome. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you you guys for coming on.